Erskine Distinguished Lecture. This year, the Erskine Lecture is being combined with MCU's Legacy of Bella Wood, 100 Years of Making Marines Winning Battles Lecture Series. Our topic today is the Manpower Renaissance. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of Marine Corps University, Brigadier General William Powers. General Holford, Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, Rob Barra, Colonel Barra, distinguished guests, general officers, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the significant event, the third event in our Bellowood Lecture Series, Legacy of Bellowood, 100 Years of Making Marines, Winning Battles. Our keynote speaker for today was the 33rd Assistant Commandant of the Marine Corps. He retired in fall 2016 after a legendary 42-year career in the Marine Corps, General John M. Paxton, Jr. Our moderator and scene setter for the event is our distinguished historian emeritus, Dr. Charlie Niemeyer. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, General just explained, this is the third in a series of four. And what I have is the connective tissue. I'm getting you from General Gray to General Paxton, so I'm going to be off just for 15 minutes or so, and I'm going to go through some slides, talk about Marine Corps in the 1950s, and then getting this up through the Vietnam era. Now, my job is not to necessarily talk about battles and leaders as such, but the development of the Corps and how we kind of changed over time in those two decades. They're very important decades to understand. So I'm going to kind of briefly kind of just cruise us through these, these two decades to get us up to the point where uh, General Paxton uh, actually just gets ready to come on active duty as a young officer at that time and, and then takes us up through uh, what I call the Great Personnel Campaign and into uh, the modern era. So without any further ado, uh, let me see if I can get this thing to advance. So one of the important things for us to know as Marines is this particular act. Now, this is called the Douglas Mansfield Act of 1952. Now, if there's one thing that I've learned from my years of studying the Marine Corps history, is that commandants of the Marine Corps worry about one thing when they get up in the morning, and they worry about one thing just before they go to sleep at night, and that is end strength, force structure. And the reason why they worry about it, at least since 1950, is because just prior to the Korean War, the Marine Corps nearly got itself cut out of existence through DOD budget cuts as well as changes and the lay down to the national force structure. A lot of this happened to do with the advent of nuclear weapons. And this is going to be a factor is that can we use conventional forces in the nuclear environment? Because in 1949, 1950, the uh, Joint Chiefs were convinced that there was going to be a combination of conventional forces and nuclear weapons used on future battlefields. And if you put a large number of Marines, like the three divisions we sent ashore in Iwo Jima in 1945, they are an inviting target for a single nuclear weapon to take everybody out all at once. So they allowed the Marine Corps to go down to a division minus just prior to the Korean War. So when we have to get over to Korea in, in June 1950 and make the Inchon landing in, in, in September of 1950, we are hard pressed to put a single division in the field. So a couple of folks that are in Congress at the time are going to try to remedy that with legislation. Now, the 1947 National Security Act said that there will be an Air Force, that there will be an Army, that there will be a Navy, but they said very little about the Marine Corps. And so as a result, there was a way in which the DOD, the new Department of Defense, was established in 1947, basically whittled away at the Marines until we were almost around the era in the National Security Force structure. So the Douglas Mansfield Act comes along at the right time, 1952, and it mandates in law that there will be three active duty divisions, three active duty wings, one reserve division, one reserve wing. And oh, by the way, the Commandant of the Marine Corps will sit as a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on matters pertaining to Marine Corps affairs. I know for a fact that looking at General Shepard's record of 
JCS meetings, for instance, he made about one every four meetings. In fact, that actually ramps up. So by the time General Wilson is going to become the first permanent member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which General Pax is going to talk to you about in a bit, that in fact what we get is that the Marine Corps Commandant was literally sitting on every single meeting. So it was kind of like just making the obvious uh, fact in law. But it wasn't in law leading up to this time. So the Douglas Manfield Act is very important. But this allows the Marine Corps to basically get the high ground in American inter-service politics. So now we're never going to be able to go, be forced to go back to that division minus. Doesn't mean we're going to be, a, we, we, our core numbers aren't going to go up and down. But I got to tell you a personal story that, that has to do with uh, General Mundy when I was at Plans, Policies, and Operations. And, and I, I realized this personnel issue and how it hit home to me uh, very, very strongly when I was a, a major uh, on PPO staff. And I worked right down the hall from General Mundy's office. They were in the old headquarters building, FB2, if you recall, General. Uh, and the Commandant's <laughs> office was in the corner of the second deck. And, and, and uh, the, the interesting thing about this was that uh, there was a talk at the time, right after the Cold War ended, that they were going to go down to what they called the base force, which is they're going to drop the Marine Corps down to about 159,000 Marines. And the Commandant was kind of on the fence as to whether or not he was going to go along with that. And while that was being debated, and we were down at pp &O writing up point papers for the Commandant all the time about this particular issue, I saw a parade of uh, retired flag officers former commandants going in to see General Monday. And it was one after the other. And then, next thing I know, we had the masses coming out. We're not going to 159, we're going to hold the 173, and that's exactly what we did. Because I learned a very valuable lesson. Commandants never let them go up and turn. Okay? And that's the key here, is that this act enables us to maintain a basement so that we'll never again be put in a position where we're in 1950. This guy is Mike Mansfield. And the reason why I bring him up is he was part, he was co-author of this act. He was in the House of Representatives at the time. He's one year from going into the Senate. He's going to become the Senate Armed Services Committee Chairman for longer than almost anybody in history. I think he and John Warner are hiring for the number one and number, number two spots of the longest term tenure as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. But before he does that, Mike Mansfield is in the House. He serves in the House from 1943 to 1953. In 1953, he was elected to the United States Senate. So Paul Douglas is also a former Marine, and he's going to sponsor the, the bill in the Senate. But the Douglas Mansfield Act is, is passed because of the personality of these two guys. But it's important to note that Mike Mansfield was served in the Navy, he lied about his age, served in the Navy on the USS Minneapolis in World War I. Uh, he enlisted in the Army when he returns to the Navy after the Navy found out he was 14 years old when he signed up for service. Uh, and they kicked him out to join the Army, and the Army didn't realize he was still underage, and they kicked him out. Uh, but eventually, he joins the Marine Corps in 1920. He serves in the active in the Marines legally now uh, as, as, as a young private. And he is later going to serve long terms in Congress. He's going to become one of the distinguished leaders we've ever had in this, in this, in this august body. And, and he's going to be the ambassador to Japan for almost uh, 12 years. He holds every kind of award you can possibly imagine. President Ronald Reagan is going to give him the Medal of Freedom in 1988. And, and this guy is basically going to live to be 98 years old. I believe he passes away just after the turn of the century. And when he passed away, he requested one thing. And I want to show this to you. This is his grave. He's in Arlington Cemetery. It's in view of Arlington House right now. And you'll know. It says, Michael Joseph Nancy, a private United States Marine Corps. <laughs> nothing about ambassador, nothing about senator, nothing about all the awards. It says, private United States Marine Corps. That was his proudest thing that he had in his background. And that's the important thing to understand about that guy. An extraordinary American. Okay, we also got to talk about another person in the 1950s because I believe that he's probably one of the most underestimated commandants we've ever had. He was commandant of the Marine Corps right after General Vandenberg left office in 1948, and he's going to stay commandant from 48 through, through the unification fights of 1949, all the way up through the uh, Korean War, and 1952, he's going to turn it over to uh, General Len Shep. But in, in it, the interesting part of that quote the case is he kind of, his career kind of traces this lecture. He's the second lieutenant of Bella Wood. He's shot in the head. He's hit in the helmet, by the way. He doesn't penetrate the helmet, but it knocks him out. He's out for 15 minutes. He wakes up. He begins the attack in the town of Russia's. He assumes command of the Marines that are around him. His famous line, I have two Marines to my left, one to my right, I can hold. There's a famous book about him right now called I Will Hold. Okay, and put in case, his long reach extends to the 1950s for this reason. And nobody knows this. 
Uh, he retires from the commandancy in 1952, and he comes to Quantico. He takes a reduction in rank to the rank of lieutenant general and requests to be given command of Marine Corps schools. The very job that General Bowers holds today. Okay, and he's going to take the Marine Corps into the new era, the post-Korea, post-World War II era, vertical assault, lighter, tighter, faster, more deployable Marine Corps. But in case this is such an important mission, he requests a reduction in rank and requests assignment to the Marine Corps School where he stays here for another two and a half years before he retires full time to his home on the uh, South River in Annapolis, Maryland. So that's the long reach of Clifton Case. So we have tri times of triumph and tribulation in the Marine Corps in the 1950s. One of the problems that the Marine Corps had in the 1950s was we were rank heavy. I did some research in 1954, for instance, 40% of the United States Marine Corps held the rank of NCO or higher, enlisted Marines. 40% were NCOs or higher in the enlisted ranks. Officer ranks were overloaded with World War II and Korean War veterans. The young officers then coming in in the post-Korean War era, there was very little room for them to move up. A lot of them were getting out. Tremendous amount of turnover in the officer ranks because of that reason. The Marine Corps started to kind of look away from personnel uh, issues as well as its ability to uh, physical fitness, standards in, in, in uh, uniform and, and haircuts and that sort of thing. But eventually, they're going to come back to the idea that what the Marine Corps really needs to be about is readiness, readiness. And this whole idea of readiness is going to put the Marine Corps in competition with the Army for uh, nation's 911 forces, I'd like to say. We work on vertical assault during this time frame, and we know for a fact that General, the future General Krulak, then he was a colonel, there's a great picture of him that uh, we're hitting, he's getting picked up right in front of Breckenridge Hall almost, where it is, and dragged across the ground in a spy rig as he's hoisted above, uh, hoisted into a helicopter he, to prove that uh, people can be picked up from the ground by helicopters. He got beat up in the process, but he didn't let anybody know about that. Uh, the brute being who he is, uh, he basically got it out, got picked up, and went up there. But we worked on this project, and it was perfect timing for the Marine Corps. And the reason why it was perfect timing was because of this, is that at the time, they assumed the use of nuclear weapons on the battlefield. What better way to distribute the force than that coming over long distances through the air? You don't put everybody on ships all co-located together. So vertical assault had a, had a double-edged sword. Number one, it, it could basically get us ashore quickly, but the downside was the helicopters at the time did not have a lot of lift capacity, which we're going to work on uh, throughout the 60s and 70s, and into the modern era even, uh, to get that heavy lift helicopter to get us ashore. But it was perfect timing for the vertical assault concept to come along uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and they learned it right here at Quantico. Just when things are going really well, we have a kind of a watershed moment in Marine Corps history in the 1950s. 1956, the famous Ribbon Creek incident, where Staff Sergeant McCown marches his platoon into a tidal marsh outside of Paris Island. There's a number of unseen potholes. The tide comes in, and six Marines are drowned uh, in this training accident. Uh, this becomes a crisis moment for the Marine Corps. General Pate, who was the commandant at the time, puts uh, General uh, Wallace Green in charge of the investigation. It's a very rigorous investigation. They try a staff sergeant account for manslaughter. And as I was doing research on this, I realized something else. I said, is this was this a problem in the, in, in the recruiting service, or was it an anomaly? So I did some back research, and I looked at the number of recruits that went through boot camp from 1951 to 1955, and I discovered there was 192,000 recruits were trained at Paris Island in San Diego. Not a single training death occurred. So while well, Ribbon Creek was, in fact, a significant event because it put the Marine Corps kind of on trial. We lost a lot of the goodwill we had with the American public with all the, you know, the results of Korea and so forth and so on. So it was important that we address it, and the Commandant as well as General Green in particular addressed it very, very strongly. There were still some problems that they uncovered besides, besides the, uh, the drowning incident. There was a problem of, uh, you know, the uh, drill instructors getting a little too aggressive with some of the recruits. They were able to dial that back in through aggressive enforcement. They also began to assign senior staff NCOs and officers in larger numbers to the recruit depots. And they're going to continue that when we get into General Paxton's talk. During the same time frame in 1958, here's a significant uh, fact that, that we need to understand. It's Operation Blueback, the second Marine Division large elements of the two MEF uh, forces out of Camp Lejeune, as well as the, the uh, MU that's afloat in the Mediterranean, are going to lead this uh, action. We're going to go into Beirut in 1906, or 1958, and we're going to occupy literally the, the, uh, the, the, the city of Beirut without any casualties at all. 
Second Lieutenant Carl Mundy is on this operation. Uh, he goes on Operation Blue Bat. One of the hallmarks of this operation is the readiness of the Marine Corps is seen and noted by everybody, including the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So the idea that the Marines can be on station and be ashore and can get the job done is hammered home in the 1950s. Readiness, readiness, readiness is going to be emphasized in the late 50s and throughout the early 60s. Here is the uh, second two map Marines entering Beirut in 1958. A little bit of different reception 25 years later. Uh, but at this time, it was pretty friendly in 1958. Okay, next slide, please. There you go. 1960 is probably the hallmark uh, of the Marine Corps getting its readiness act together. Uh, just prior to a uh, general shoot taking office, the Marine Corps has a five year plan, a surge in effect, to, become, to increase its readiness. It recognizes through Operation Blue Bat that readiness is going to be the key to the future of the Marine Corps. The idea that we're going to be stationed at the front lines of, of the Marine Corps of democracy, if you will. We're going to be out there uh, with the Navy. We're going to be deploying the news. We're going to be deploying overseas, Okinawa. So we need to be ready, ready as, as, as we can ever be. General Shoot is especially aggressive in emphasizing this readiness campaign. In the middle of all this, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a major issue that's going to take place in 1962 that's going to really emphasize the Marine Corps' role in future amphibious operations. And that's going to be the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Cuban Missile Crisis happens at a time when, by the way, everybody in this room, uh, we came this close to, to annihilation in 1962. 13 days in October 1962 were probably the closest the world has ever come to, to emulation. Uh, and, and as a result of the two missile crisis, one of the options that was being talked about in Kennedy's XCOM was landing a large scale, making a large scale amphibious landing on the shores of Cuba. Now, Leslie, according to the report, David Alberstam, General, General Shoot talks the, uh, the, the Joint Chiefs out of this option by putting a map up in the tank and showing a map of a uh, parallel. And this little dot that goes right in the center of this map. And then he puts a, a, a overlays a map of Cuba over top of Tower and of course it dwarfs Tower. Uh, Cuba could actually run from New York City almost to Chicago. That's how long it is, how large it is. And he puts this little dot on the board and says, that's Tower. And then he puts the United States up behind that and he says, he says, sir, that little island costs us 3,000 marine casualties. Can you imagine what it's going to cost to take this island? So that took the landing operation off the table. But nonetheless, the Marine Corps realized there may come a moment where you have to make large scale amphibious operations. This is the guy we're going to go against. He's in the UN saying the United States are boys and we're going to come ashore. He was convinced he was going to be invaded, especially by the United States Marines. Uh, but General Shoot was the one that said, no, maybe we're going to look for another option. And that's exactly what they did. So just prior to the Vietnam War, we have two major operations that many people are uh, not aware of in the world history Operation Steel Bike, Operation Silver Lance. These are major amphibious operations on each coast where we lift the entire MEF. The entire MEF. Two MEF is going to be lifted to row to Spain. They're going to take 60 ships. They're going to need to commission some commercial ships in order to get there. But it successfully proves that the Marine Corps can still lift a MEF if needed and land on a, on a shore if necessary. Could we do that today? What's the amphibious lift capability of the United States Navy today? Much reduced, much lower. Okay? Now, we don't have the requirement anymore for lifting a map, but we have at least two combat brigades we'd like to get out there. Okay? And even then, we're stretching it with the amphibious lift we have on hand right now. Okay, we also have 1965 a Dominican Republic intervention. Once again, ready Marines, 2 MEF, the Caribbean Mew are going to go ashore. They're going to basically restore order in San Domingo. They're going to be there for a short period of time. They're going to go in, they're going to go out. But it gives the impression to the Joint Chiefs, it gives the impression to the American people, it gives the impression to Congress, the Marine Corps is ready. It's ready to go when called upon and needed. And to conclude, I want to talk a little bit about the Vietnam intervention because I see this in Marine Corps history as kind of an anomaly to Marine Corps doctrine. We're told to go into Vietnam, we're going to go into the I Corps zone of operations, we're going to talk about that in a second. But this is a picture of Brigadier General Frederick Karch. He was an Iwo Jima veteran. He is the commanding officer of the 9th MEB, and they're going to go ashore at Da Nang in 1965. You can see he's real happy. <laughs> he's got flowers being put around him by ladies that are meeting him on the beach. They actually do an amphibious assault on the beaches of Da Nang because it was good practice. They knew they weren't going to have any opposition. They were met by uh, Vietnamese ladies with flowers, and they put them around all the senior officers. He was one. You can see he was real thrilled about getting his flowers. Okay? Nonetheless, 
The Marine Corps is going to operate in that northern tactical area of operation. They call it I Corps, the northern part that goes up to the DMZ. And it's odd because you would think an amphibious oriented <coughs> force like the Marine Corps would be more at home in the Mekong Delta River Valley area. But, that, but the United States Army gets that mission. The Marines get this mission because we were ready. They had one unit they could call on to go ashore quickly to secure Da Nang and the air base around Da Nang, and that was the 9th map. So that's why we got the I Corps mission. We built upon the 9th map after that. It wasn't the fact that we had to be ready because we were ready to go in with the forces that were, that were available. We would not have been in the I Corps. We probably would have been down south in, in the uh, Mekong Delta. Vietnam is an interesting kind of experience for the Marine Corps. I'm not going to go into the battles of leaders here because I want to get right into what General Paxton's talk. But in Vietnam, it's important to understand that we were not prepared for a long stay. The Marine Corps did not have the equipment, did not have the supply. Colonel Hatton's in the audience here. They did not have the logistics for an eight-year campaign in I-4. Okay, and as a result, okay, the Marine Corps is always baking, borrowing, and scraping. They do put a naval activity ashore that's going to help with that. But nonetheless, the Marine Corps never really did have a wealth of riches in fighting that battle. The good side of this of our experience here, the combat leadership that we developed in Vietnam, as well as the combat experience that our, our enlisted Marines did, as well as the officers brought back, was valuable for later generations, and it was a part of the network later on. But the Marine Corps basically is, is definitely not prepared for an eight-year stay, especially in I. Vietnam personnel issues, Project McNamara's Project 100,000, the Marine Corps takes its share of Category 4 enlistees, which means enlistees that barely score uh, the, um, the amount of numbers that you need to get on the GCT test in order to be a service member. Uh, we were told we're taking uh, our fair share as all the services were told this. Uh, it was sort of like a, a program to help improve people. It turned out to be effective in some cases, mostly not. Uh, it, but they also basically had a problem with, uh, in, in this case, uh, there was a retention issue due to this uh, rise in numbers we had to have. The Marine Corps is going to top 300,000 going to Vietnam War. We're also going to rely on the draft. A lot of people I talked to today think that the Marine Corps has always been volunteers. Well, we weren't. Even in World War II, we took draftees. We took draftees in Korea. We took draftees in Vietnam. Okay? We haven't taken draftees since 1973, which Jeff Max is going to talk to you about in a minute. But it's important to understand that we kind of got along with draftees. We, we were able to fill out the force with draftees. And then the government's going to pull that rug out from underneath the services in 1973. We're going to talk about the fallout of that. The upshot of Vietnam is, again, an exception to gaining valuable combat experience. The uh, Marine Corps doesn't really, uh, doesn't really get a lot to take back for doctrine from the Vietnam War. It's the interregnum between the large-scale amphibious operations and then the new modern era that's going to emerge in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that uh, Jim Pax is going to talk to you about. The uh, Corps is not prepared for this long extended operation uh, in Vietnam, but it does well combat-wise in the battlefield. So, I believe that's my last slide, and I believe now I'll turn it over to Jim Pax to introduce these. Thanks, turn that off for a minute. Thanks. Hold that one. Hold that one. Thanks. <coughs> okay. Uh, you can see it, that's a spoiler alert. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, great to be with you. Thanks to Dr. E. Meyer. I want to publicly thank Annette Ammerman from the uh, research branch who helped out here. Uh, I want to thank uh, General Bowers and the folks at Marine Corps University for this opportunity. So, I'm going to give you two or three spoiler alerts before we get started here. Uh, the first one is I'm going to give you the bottom line up front what this is all about. You're going to have a lot of PMEs in your schools this year. We have Seth MCL Academy, EWS Command and Staff. Uh, we will, uh, we war. And, and the bottom line is you're going to learn about tactics, you're going to learn about equipment, you're going to learn about modernization, you're going to learn about campaigning. The takeaway from today is you can't do any of that without people. So the focus for today is people. And we're going to talk about a people renaissance in the Marine Corps. And the renaissance is really a little bit of reformation, and it's really a little bit of house cleaning. So the second message is, that change comes to every organization. Sometimes it's in regards to a threat, and how you prepare for a threat, and the weapons you get, and the training you need. Other times you realize that the potential threat is either inside the wire, or just outside the wire. And it takes a little bit of difference to uncover that threat, to plan how to counteract it, and then finally it takes leaders, and leadership, and moral courage, and tenacity, to win that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 
We're going to talk about the Marine Corps that you may not have heard about and you may not recognize. I know General Colbert's here, General Fields is here, and Colonel Bynes here, and a couple others. So I'm, I'm going to give you like the movie version of this pitch. If it was a movie, right now the screen would go black. And then there'd be white ticker tape that comes across the front. And it's going to say, the events and the stories you're about to witness are real. They actually happen. Or for those of you who are modern, it will be a slant diagonal screen, and the screen will come up and say, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Okay? Well, we're going to talk about a hiccup and an anomaly in the Marine Corps that doesn't match what happened between 1916 and 1918. It doesn't match what happened between 1939 and 1946. And indeed, doesn't have too many parallels in the history of the Marine Corps. And one of your homework assignments, same thing for our brothers and sisters, Army, Navy, Air Force, Allied partners, one of your assignments is to make sure your indications and warnings are up and it never happens again. So those of us who lived through this, it was a trying time. Lieutenants and staff sergeants, it was not re-enlisting or augmentation. It was like, is today an in-day or an out-day? I mean, that's where the Marine Corps was for a handful of years. And I give you that not to be a downer here, but to tell you it was a different time. So the third piece of the message is you can't get through this without leaders. And I'm going to talk about two of them here, Louis H. Wilson and Robert H. Barrow. And to those who came out of Vietnam, like General Fields and General Fulford, perhaps multiple tours, and knew they were in the Marine Corps for the long haul, and knew they had done great things in Vietnam tactically, and knew we had a sound plan operationally, they were concerned strategically about where America was going, where the Marine Corps was going, and how to right the ship. And I will tell you that from the late 70s, when these two leaders, the early 70s, when these two leaders were coming into key roles, either at FMF PAC, at Fleet Marine Forces Atlantic, at the Deputy for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, and then later, as two commandants successively, they changed the ship. They changed the course of the Marine Corps. To the point that for some of us who came in back then, when you hear their names, you kind of genuflect. And, and that's it. That's the reverence we have for these two Marines. And I'm going to talk a little bit about them in a minute so you understand them and their backgrounds before we paint the picture of the Marine Corps at that time. And then the third piece is the Marine Corps today, the lessons learned. So as you look at that photo, and as I look at them, on the left, Lewis H. Wilson, okay? Medal of Honor, except you look at it, he's only wearing six ribbons there. The one on the upper left on the inside, of course, is a Medal of Honor. The one next to it, there's no two over, three Purple Hearts. And I'm going to explain where that came from before. When I see that picture, though, I see a recruiting photo. Because there is a recruiting poster there. And General Wilson's standing just like that. And the quote underneath it says, I am they, and it will be done. <laughs> Pretty clear message to about 196,000 of us. Okay, we got the boss. General Barrow on the right. You look at his decorations and awards there. Navy Cross. I'll talk about where and when for that. Distinguished Service Cross. Same thing. Silver Star. Bronze Star Combat B. Three different wars, four different campaigns, four different awards. But still in the heat of battle. And knew what the Marine Corps was all about. Both of them had extensive time, either in recruiting or recruit training, to go with their operational credibility. And as General Bauer would explain years and years later, he'd say, it's about people. It's all about people. Next slide. Nice. All right, General Wilson, uh, born in Grand Mississippi, graduate of Millsaps College, uh, came into the Marine Corps on the eve of uh, World War II, was a company commander in Fox 2-9 at Font Hill in Guam. His battalion commander, Robert Cushman, would be the 25th Commandant be his predecessor. Both of them legendary gunfighters in the Second World War. General Wilson in July of 1944 wounded three times in combat and then still went and took the hardest mission at Font Hill in Guam. Went out 50 yards in front of friendly lines to rescue a Marine single-handedly pulling back and it took 17 Marines to make the final assault up to get the high ground to be able to stop the Japanese from a counterattack. 
13 of those 17 Marines never came back. Joe Wilson wounded again, lost a lung, held the hill, Medal of Honor, three Purple Hearts. But then he went on, Battalion Commander 2-5, lots of time in Quantico, formal schools, uh, RS New York City, 6th District, all over the map, lots of time in the Western Pacific at Paycom. But he had not only operational credibility, training credibility, recruit credibility, people credibility, and he would come in to be our uh, 26th Commandant of the Marine Corps. As uh, Dr. Niemeyer said, the first Commandant to be a sitting member of the Joint Chiefs. Hard for many in the group here to fathom, but the Marine Corps I came in, the Commandant had to get invited to go into the tank. You know, got the General, General Dunford, okay, he was the aide for General Monday later on, okay? Can you imagine the difference in, in 40 years from not being able to go into the tank to being the chairman? It's generational. It happens in your lifetime. Next slide. Thanks. General Wilson, Medal of Honor recipient, as I said. Next slide. Okay, General Robert H. Barrow, St. Francisville, uh, Louisiana. Starts at LSU. He's in a PLC program. He's waiting tables. He's working because the Corps of Cadets is down there. It's a military school. And he decides, hey, the war's going to pass me by. Don't, don't want to lose the big one. Never know when they're coming again, OK? So he goes in and lists. Goes out to MCRD San Diego. Does very, very well as a recruit and as a young Marine. So well, they ask him to stay on and train other recruits. He's tall. He's physically fit. He's articulate. He's quiet, but he's steely. Demeanor and engaged. He stays out there, does well as a corporal, gets picked up for OCS, goes back to OCS. Just talking to his son, Lieutenant Colonel Rob Barrow, great Marine in his own right here, but we're talking about his dad's experiences. Let me tell you a story about General Barrow. Early on as a young officer, he gets orders. He's going to be the SACO. How many of you here have been the SACO? Okay, no, it's not what you think. It's not substance abuse control officer. Okay, this is the Sino American Cooperative Organization. And that's about how much he knows of it, too. And it's kind of like get your weapon, get your rug, and meet them at the front lines. General Barrow on his own works his way across the United States, books passage to India, goes from India back in the time in Cambodia, takes a train and walks up country, hitches a lift, flies over the hump into China. And he winds up linking up with the Chinese guerrillas to fight the Japanese in North China. He's so busy over there fighting, he doesn't know about Iwo Jima. He doesn't know about Okinawa this month, February, March, okay? He doesn't know about them until finally the word catches up to him and says, hey, look, I hope you're not fighting anymore because we won. <laughs> and oh, by the way, when you go into this garrison and take the surrender from this uh, Japanese, I forget, colonel or general officer, that's General Barrow during the Second World War. He goes back, debriefs his activities, you know, recognize Bronze Star Combat B. He comes back, debriefs his activities, winds up getting hooked up with General Keller Rocky over in the far uh, Pacific, and winds up coming back with him to the East Coast. Another indication there of leadership, initiative, and bringing good folks along. But that's General Barrow. Now, what do we got here? Okay, let me talk. I talked about General Wilson and Fonce Hill and Guam. I told you General Barrow, Navy Cross recipient, Distinguished Service Cross, and uh, Silver Star, in addition to that Bronze Star. So let's go in order. Here's General Barrow in Korea, Alpha 1-1. I just happened to have the privilege of being out of First Marines as a regimental commander, and our story out there was, hey, the rest of the Marine Corps is violently interested. But the, when the Commandant says, uh, fall in, uh, right face, forward, march, it's Alpha 1-1 who's leading us. The whole Marine Corps is going after Alpha 1-1. Well, Robert H. Barrow got Alpha 1-1. And he took him into Incheon. And then after Incheon, he took him across the Han. And they took him into Seoul. And he went into Yangdong Po and the railway station. And Alpha 1-1 was one of the most bloody units going through there. Not the blood that they received, but the blood they inflicted. And the first unit, perhaps, that saw tanks, Chinese Soviet tanks, coming south through Yangdong Po. But he held the high ground there. And when he was asked by the media afterwards what happened, he kind of explained, grazing, planking, on fire, fire, forced Marines to dig in, forced Marines to go house to house, and he said, and then our Marines, they stood cool and they stood tall. Okay? Well, as only General Powell could say in that Louisiana accent, 
And of course, being six foot four, it later became he stood cool and he stood tall. Okay? And that, that moniker kind of stayed with him. And when General Barrow walked in the room, just like General Wilson, they both had piercing blue eyes. And everybody kind of took a step back, straightened up a little bit, and make sure your shoes were real good, you know? So I think I'm a tree. And whatever you were thinking about, you want to make sure. They look at you very pleasantly. And both Terry Gloves at the time, white and black, until they started wrapping them on their left shoulder seat. And you weren't sure whether that hand was coming out to shake you or something else was going to happen. Okay? <laughs> but you minded your P's and Q's with these two men. General Barrow, with Alpha 1 1 again, Hill uh, 1081, uh, Foot and Chillman Pass. He had the mission to take the island. There's a lot of brave units and a lot of brave Marines out there. Uh, Taplet in 3 5, Ray Davis in uh, 7th Marines. But Robert H. Barrow went up to 1081 and held Foot and Chillman Pass so that they could get across the uh, Causeway Bridge and make their way back down to Coterie and get out to Wonson and the evacuation from uh, the uh, withdrawal under pressure from Chosen Reservoir. 8 December 1950, started out at 14 degrees below zero, finished the fight at 25 degrees below zero, with him and a handful of Marines from Alpha 1-1 taking the high ground and holding it against numerous Chinese counterattacks. And just like his friend and former Commandant General Wilson, hand to hand fighting as General Wilson endured at Front Hill. Next slide. Thank you. So, where's this all going in the Marine Corps? What's going on in the Marine Corps as we come out of Vietnam? In 1973, as you heard Dr. Niemeyer say, the Marine Corps had been up to 320 some thousand. Uh, we're on our way back down. We're about 198 to 201 in that time frame. Army still has. 50 to 70,000 left in Vietnam. The Marines have 500 advisors. Vietnam from 71 to 73 looks like Vietnam from 62 to 65. It's just advisors in there. And we're trying to figure out how to get out. Now, the United States is in an uproar about Vietnam. In the United States and in a lot of parts of the military, Vietnam was not an eight year war, an 11 year war. It was a one year war fought eight times. Or a one year war fought 11 times. And they were less than slaughtered and less than drilled. That wasn't true with the tactical level. If you talk to the corporal from the Marine unit, you talk to the lieutenant Marine unit, they never lost a fight. And they were in their sleeves up and rolling every day. But strategically, we didn't get to where we needed to go. We're going to talk about some of the personnel policies and what happened there. Starting in 1969, based on some advice from people at RAND and IDA and some economic analysis at uh, Columbia University, the decision was. The war is unpopular. It's unpopular at home with the parents. It's unpopular with the college students. The draft is incredibly unpopular. And there was a coalition of libertarians who thought we could do it better, budget reformers, analysts, and you had this unholy alliance of three or four big groups who said, look, the draft is not sustainable. The military experience is not sustainable. We're going to have to do something different. You can go that previous slide. Thanks. OK, thanks. Uh, so, starting in 1969, there was a move afoot about an all volunteer force. So much so that President Nixon asked Melvin Laird, the Secretary of Defense, to stand up a commission and look at an all volunteer force. After scrubbing tens and tens of names to figure out who it was going to be, they picked Thomas Gates, the former Secretary of Defense. But the word was already out hey, we're going to go to an all volunteer force. The military was scared to death. Because the force that it existed was based on what had been a two-year draft, and then quietly by JFK in 1962 went to a four-year draft. No fanfare, nothing four years. And like I said, the war is unpopular year after year on the college campuses. College I went to, hell, I didn't even have to take an exam until my junior year in the spring, because they shut down the school freshman and sophomore years. And one day you took your grades as of the last day of your class, and another one you had an option. You want to take the exam, you want to send the exam in by paper, or you want to just incomplete. I mean, that was college, okay? It was a great deal for a student like me. <laughs> but uh, but the, the war is going on, and it's incredibly unpopular. Uh, Nixon starts to review for the all volunteer force in 69. He rolls it out in 1971. What I started to say was, services are scared to death. General Westmoreland says, this isn't going to work. We're going to have to have countervailing argument here. We're going to have to educate the civilian leadership of the American public. If you do an all-volunteer force, you can't continue to pay them when we pay them. You can't continue to deploy them the way we deploy them. 
we can't continue to have some of the quality and the control problems we have, we're going to have to revisit the way we do business, and this is going to be an expensive proposition. So he stood up a group to study this on his own, and in fact appointed a deputy three-star to look at this. Now to show you how unpopular the draft was, the selective service system is still in place all the way through 1969. The director of the sex, uh, selective service system is Lieutenant General John Hershey. He's the same Lieutenant General John Hershey that's been running the selective service system since 1941. Okay. How do you think that resonated with mom and dad or with a 21-year-old on a college campus? So it was a different world. It was a different world. Okay, next slide. Thanks. So 1973, Congress now, as we look, will pull out of Vietnam and uh, do the uh, Paris Peace Accords. Congress goes back to revisit how the hell did we get in here in the first place? And they go back and look at August 1964. And they look about the USS Maddox and the USS Turner Joy. And was there really a confrontation? Was there really a firing? Whatever happened back then? Because the story was, it was a provocation. It was under risk. And Congress turned around and gave President Johnson what they call the War Powers Act. He says, you go do what is necessary in the crisis. We'll support you. And that's what got us into Vietnam and kept us there the whole time. They revisited that with the War Powers Act in 1973 to say, we don't want to have this happen again. We can't do incrementalism. We're not going to have another Vietnam. The same time we're doing the War Powers Act, our mindset, which had been 15, 20 years in Southeast Asia, is now the aperture is open. There's other things going on. The Arab Israeli conflict. In 1967, Egypt and Israel went to war. Egypt seized some territory. Egypt, I mean, Israel seized some territory. Egypt was not happy. Palestinians were not happy. Consequently, the Arab world thought we need to not only contain Israel, but we need to punish them for what they did in 1967. So, Yom Kippur, for 19 days in October of 1973, Egypt from the south and Syria from the north and west put pressure on and attack Israel. Brazen move by their part, pretty foolish move. Israel crushed them. Then that result, Israel took the Gaza Strip, Israel took the Golan Heights, set the stage for where we're at today, okay? And all the problems since then. But that focused the whole world in a different area. No, it didn't. They focused on the whole world, as long as the media was there, as long as we were talking about it. Uh, Dr. Meyer talked about going into Beirut. This is a precursor for many of you out here who have done time in Iraq and Afghanistan about why we're so embroiled in the Central Command AOR and with uh, religious uh, extremism and uh, tribal territorial bands and what's going on over there. The indications are there generational a long, long time ago. But it happened in 1973, it happened again in October. 1985, and we didn't we missed the signals. We missed the signals. Okay. Uh, Nixon resigns from the presidency in 1974. You have a beleaguered leader. He, as soon as he won his second term, he's constantly getting buffeted about what's going on in Vietnam. He thinks, okay, we're going to get out of Vietnam. 71, that's pretty good. We're going to announce an all-volunteer course. That's all good too. That's fine until June of 1972 at the place called the Watergate Hotel. Here, some of you probably saw it in the post when a couple of burglars were not too smooth on their feet there. And, uh, and he gets tar on his fingers. These are Tricky Dicks boys, okay? This is the Republican National Committee. And as you all know, President Nixon resigns. So when I come in, we're getting ready to press. Peace Accords are there. Uh, Nixon has just resigned. I'm thinking, geez, what the hell kind of outfit did I just join? You know, my uncle. He fought on Okinawa with a, with a division, and, uh, and, and all my father and brothers in the Second World War in the Army in Europe, and I'm thinking, this is really proud of the serve. All my buddies from college are going, you're nuts, you know? And the world out here going, well, maybe they're right, this is pretty nuts. All right, the last quote is a placeholder, South Vietnam Falls, next slide. All right, this is a picture of how not to do a Neo. <laughs> this is also a snapshot about Tactical success, operational success, strategic failure. Strategic failure. This is April 1975. We do equal pull and frequent win. One is in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. The first one that's executed on the 12th of April, largely without too much opposition, extracted back to Navy ships in the South Side China Sea. Second one is frequent win in Vietnam, 29 and 30 April. 1975. The ambassador, Martin, in Vietnam has been planning this for a while. There are 8,000 people to get out. 8,000 people. 
Excuse me, 7,000. 1,000 Americans and 6,000 Vietnamese nationals, local supporters who we have promised are feeling indebted to some type of help. So these of you that think about your turps and everything else like that, same analogy. These are folks who stood by us, and we know if we don't get them out of uh, Vietnam, they're going to get imprisoned, killed, whatever. We've got to get them out. So this is 1975. The code word for the operation, everybody knows it's going to happen. The code word is on Armed Forces Radio. And the code word is, it's 105 degrees today in Saigon and that temperatures are rising. And then they immediately play Bing Crosby and Waitresses. And that's the code to start going. In 19 hours, they get everybody out except for 400. 19 hours. The Marines at the Embassy Support Annex and the Defense Act, they're the last ones to go in 19 hours. Okay, next slide. Here's what it looks like at the other end. There's only so many people you can put on a ship, you cube it out, you square it out, you tear it out, and everything else like that. There's a, there's a second lieutenant by the name of Bob Lee who goes on to be Colonel, <coughs> earns a legion of merit as a lieutenant because he's the embarkation officer and he's trying to figure out where to put everybody on these ships. <laughs> and after they get them on, some of the pilots and crew who referred him out in the Japanese aircraft said, oh no, you don't understand, I'm not going back. At the helo staying here. Well, you need a deck spot, you either bring in an 80 hill or an hill, or the next round of evacuees, and off they go. And for a while, some of these photos, granularity, so people thought those were U.S. helos. That didn't really resonate too well in Congress either. But that's what strategic failure looks like. That's what strategic failure looks like. And this is what the Marine Corps is wrestling with. Next slide. Okay, so in the midst of all this, we're trying to figure out how to rebound. Where does the Marine Corps go from here? And I'm going to talk about a book about where the Marine Corps goes from here. I'm going to talk to you about Marty Bacon and Brookings and Jeffrey Record, who were just all of you. I mean, you think some of today's journalists have it out for the Marine Corps. They were all over quality, quantity, discipline, training, and, and they painted a pretty bleak picture from the Hill to the American public about the state of readiness and the state of affairs in the United States Marine Corps. Okay? So, uh, Marines are, are worried now. All volunteer force came in. They know that they get a lot of folks coming in, get drafted. Uh, they're going to get drafted. Look, I don't want to be in the Army and Navy. I want to go to the Marine Corps. I want to be in an elite fighting outfit. And again, at the lieutenant level, at the staff fighter level, the Marine Corps is good. They're trying to wrestle with all the people issues, the equipment issues, but the Marine Corps is good. So how do you keep the best ones here? But we're not getting the best ones in off the streets, okay? And part of the challenge is trying to get some senior Marine leaders to understand the depths of the problem. Now there is a colonel, lieutenant colonel and colonel by the name of Al Gray, and there's a colonel and brigadier general by the name of Bob Nichols, who understand what's going on. They've seen it on multiple tours of Vietnam. They've seen it back in the States, particularly in Lejeune, but also at Pendleton. More importantly, they've seen some of the unrest, people unrest, racial unrest, ethnic tensions in Okinawa, and they have a view of what needs to happen here, which is we gotta get quality in on the front end, we gotta train them in the middle, which means money and gear. But oh, by the way, we've got to give them some skills in the Marine Corps and some skills outside the Marine Corps, because there's a lot of them aren't even high school grads, and they are functionally illiterate. <laughs> Recruiting out there was, hey, look, i got to get them in. We're bringing them in the door, I'm making our quotas. And I'll tell you a story about General Barrow and that in a minute here. But we had lots of problems in terms of the people we were bringing in between 1973 and somewhere between 76 and 77. And then Kurt Hunted, and the world changed. And I'll tell you about two generals who did it and two staff NCOs who did it. Those staff NCO academy down here. Because just like we revere General Barrow and General Wilson, he talked about Sergeant Major John Massaro and Sergeant Major Crow Crawford. I mean, this is a team effort. And he needed the leadership and the example and the hard decision making and the steely eye bumped up there. And there's two Marines who distinguished themselves too who are leading the charge on the enlisted side. Next slide, thanks. Okay, and strength, and strength the Marine Corps, like I said, up over 300,000, now it's down to 196. Here is the dangerous fact, 1973, percentage of high school grads in the Marine Corps, 46%. 46%. So in 1971, when we came out of Vietnam, and we knew we were going to look at a lot of fights, yeah. Smart people and analysts said, okay, we've got to watch the central man they are, we've got to look around the world. They knew that there was going to be nuclear threat, they knew there was going to be high speed aircraft, they knew there was going to be some space issues. And the issue then was we need to beef up our aviation corps, we need to beef up our logistics corps, and 
and we need people who have technical skills. And accidentally, we level ourselves into complacency that we're going to start looking at GT and GCT scores and not high school graduate scores. At the same time, this was going on, we had a lot of unrest in the streets of America, and folks were just not going to high school or sitting through high school. And the whole fact was we didn't have an indicator of what stick to it of this and what endurance was. And we started chasing the wrong object, which was test scores, instead of sitting through, growing hard, and gutting it out. That's step. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry, that's stuff from a previous slide. Okay, all the services had this problem. But the Marine Corps had it worse than anybody else. You know, you always want to be first. This is what's in the air, really want to be first, okay? They said, but we had settled to the wrong horse here. I'll give you an example. Uh, in 1975, we brought in 340,000 folks into the armed forces. 320,000 of them went to the Army, uh, 17,000 went to the Marine Corps, and 3,000 went to the Navy. And that was the third year of the four-year draft and people cooking their services. So you can see how skewed the relationship was. The Army had a really good challenge here, but was working through the law of uh, sheer numbers different than the Marine Corps. And after the Army and the Marine Corps, it really didn't matter to the Navy. Because this was, this was a 600,000, 700,000 personnel Navy when you only get 2,000 to do a year. And the Air Force didn't have a problem at all. So this was a unique construct for the Army and Marine Corps. Next slide. Okay, so we decided we're going to tackle this. We're going to tackle the issue of quantity versus quality. Uh, we're going to look at discipline in the Marine Corps, and we're going to look at high school grads. Uh, Dr. Niemeyer was kind enough to remind me about this letter that came in from, from a lieutenant in Okinawa. And you talk about that new guy's senior leadership, he's talking about, hey, here's what it is in my platoon. I want you to know what's going on here. Now, just for the sake of argument, 1974, a year later, Lieutenant Paxton is in Bravo 1-3. Boy, I'm happy. We didn't have IOC back then, you know, OCS, TBS, so many people out there conquering the world. Reserve Commission, not sure I'm standing in the Marine Corps, okay? But I show up in front of the platoon. 42 PO platoon, 141 and 1, 42. We got 32 on the books. Most students were only made about 65 or 70 percent back then. Okay, 32 on the books. I show up at the first day of morning formation. There's 18 out there. And not only is there 18 out there, that's only because the right guy has chased the last three down the ladder well. There's only 15 when I get out there. One of them's in flip flops, the other's got a poncho running around him. About three or four have pseudofolliculitis barbae, which we didn't know what PFP was at the time. You had to look it up. They couldn't shave. One of them had pierced ears, had two picks holding his ears open. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, yeah, I don't think they warned me about this. This is a different type of leadership problem. Okay? Uh, and then you start looking at the track record. You saw and then give my platoon commander's notebook ready. And it's, hey, Private Niemeyer. Gee, Private Niemeyer has been in the Marine Corps for two years now. Oh, private third award. <laughs> oh, no, no, he was acquitted at the special court marshal, so he's only got two summaries and three NJPs. <laughs> what the hell is Private Niemeyer doing the 72 Bravo Company 1 3? Because you can give it up. You know, you put it to a trial, you get acquitted, you can't discharge it. General Wilson, General Barrow, who's General Nichols by now has moved on, General Barrow is now a deputy for manpower. General Wilson is a commandant. And the two of them said, we see this problem, we hear this problem, we try around, we got, we're going to help you fix it. And by sheer strength of personality, sheer strength of contact, because the two of them and their cadre, folks like General Nichols, uh, General Gray, Colonel Gray at the time on his way to Fourth Marines, couple of sergeants major, they know, they see the problem, they know the problem, they're going to fix the problem. And like I said, I am they, it will be done. There's not a whole lot of socializing of the problem here, okay? <laughs> the socializing goes over to the hill because the hill is killing them in testimony. You know, General Wilson, one time in testimony, standing there, he says, I assure you, and I can't remember his voice there, he says, I assure you, if there are only three of us, if it's me and Sergeant Major Massaro and our driver, we will be a ready Marine Corps. <laughs> but you know, he's put him on notice, he says, please leave it to me. I know we've got some house cleaning to do. I'm going to pick the ranks. Bear with me when we get a little smaller, that'll actually help you out because most of you have not, we're saving money. You know, General Ford, General Carter, we're actually saving money. But as we're doing the drawdown, General Wilson's saying, I can help you with that drawdown. 
I got a couple easy targets to go for. So that's what we're looking at. Okay, we're sorry we're going to change from uh, GCT to high school grads, all right? There's a snapshot of what the Marine Corps looks like. You just read it, it's pretty shocking. I, I don't need to beat the drum here, but to our brothers and sisters in the Army, Navy, the Air Force, like I said, we were leading the charge here for better or for worse, okay? Uh, and we had problems, we had disciplinary rates. So we, we had a high rate in the break, you were doing burger business every week. It was a requirement, you know, they were down there. That's how you found that last 10%. Okay, next slide. Oh, can you go back again? Sure. Uh, deploy units. One of the things made some recall when you talk about readiness is we were worried about as the money for and strength uh, evaporated from coming down, and as we started discharging people, we were worried about the ones that are left that you love, that you really want to train. We were worried if they can stay combat ready, and if there's enough of them on the tarmac or enough of them on the ramp to do this. And we were saying, hey, we're going to start calculating units. Okay, second battalion, seventh Marines. Okay, you, you rate four companies, you only got two on the books, that's all you're allowed to have. But maybe we only need one and a half, okay? We're going to get rid of a couple of platoons here. And, and that's where the Marine Corps was. One three when I checked in, one three had two rifle companies. Two three had two rifle companies. There was no three three. That was the Marine Corps. And you were still cleaning the house, okay? Sometimes you drive leadership by transfer. Hey, we're going to stand up three three next month. Okay, we discharge five by expeditious discharge program. What happened to the next two? Okay, we don't do that. You can't do that today. You got two commands, two books, yeah. That, that's where the Marine Corps was back then. Okay, disciplinary problems. All right. <clears throat> There's a core desertion rate. So, 1973, Marine Corps is 196,000. 63,470 incidents in the UA. Now, some of those were repeat offenders. They liked it so much the first time they get one again, okay? <laughs> but that is still 30% of the Marine Corps. 28 to 32% of the Marine Corps is UA. Next slide. Okay, boot camp. Obviously, you can't have good Marines unless you recruit good Marines, train them up to standard, and inculcate them with the core values. There was a problem that recruit training at the Marine Corps. You can see up there, not this slide, it's on another one, the number of incidents of recruit abuse, uh, and, and it was high at both San Diego and Paris Island, and we had several really publicly notorious and really heinous offenses. I'm going to talk about Lynn McClure from Lufkin, Texas, who, unbeknownst to either a recruiter or a drill instructor, had been refused entry into the Army and the Air Force, but was accepted into the Marine Corps. Now, those of you, how many here in drill, drill field time or recruiting time? Show him. Big hands. Put them up. I love you. Put them up, okay? Can you imagine? Shipping someone in Paris Island today who you knew was refused by the Army and the Air Force. No offense to our brothers and sisters in the other services, okay? <laughs> and, and I'm sure they don't think they say, hey, the Marine Corps didn't want this one. You know, like, you know if you see a knife in the first act, somebody's going to get stabbed in the third act. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that just don't change our spots, okay? <laughs> so now you have somebody who refused entry by two other services. He's a little bit emotionally challenged, and he's a disciplinary problem. You think that's a reason why he's not paying attention? You think that's a reason why he's not grasping things? Instead of putting him in a pugil state and beating him senseless, to put him in a coma. And you take him to the hospital, and you remove about a quarter to a third of his skull. He stays in intensive care for 90 days and dies in the hospital. How do you think that resonated in Lufkin, Texas? How do you think that resonated on Capitol Hill? Okay, so off go the medicine man, the wise man, to explain, as he said, we didn't do this for 15 years. No recruit training desk for 15 years. I know you all remember Ribbon Creek and Stash on McKean, but we changed. It's not like that. Well, yeah, work with us. Will you give us time to clean our own house? And thanks to folks like uh, the two that uh, Dr. Niemeyer mentioned there, uh, and the Marines in Congress, they let General Wilson and General Barrow do this. Based on their character, based on their credibility and based on their conviction that we're going to do this. We're going to write our own ship. You know, help is a four-letter word. We don't need your help. We got this one, okay? Now, part of the problem is inside the service. Where you think, hey, it's, if it's not hard, it's not good. And if it's not good, I'll make it harder. And the other challenge is the retirees. Uh, they don't make them like they used to. I mean, most dangerous words in the world, they don't make them like they used to. It's almost as bad as they watch this, okay? <laughs> but General Wilson and General Barrow go back out, and part of their message, 
is to go to the retired community and say, we still made the land we used to. And oh, by the way, you think when you went through OCS and you think when you went through MCRD, did you expect to get beaten until you were senseless? Do you think you would have learned if that happened to you? But it's an education campaign. It's a culture campaign. It's an ethos campaign. It's an integrity campaign. And it's two general officers and two sergeants major and a handful of believers beating the drum and rallying the force and getting the message out. Getting the message out to the streets of America where we recruit. Getting the message out to recruiters and drill instructors. Getting the message out to senior Marine Corps leaders. Taking the message to Capitol Hill. And then taking the message to the media. Strength of character, strength of conviction, integrity, leadership. Two Marines, okay? Uh, next slide, yeah. Drug use, unheard of before Vietnam. Drugs were making their scene in America, thanks to Haight Ashbury in San Francisco and anywhere else. Okay, you can hear all the horror stories, whether you believe them or not, from uh, uh, all the movies in Vietnam. But drugs were making their scene in America, and we are a reflection of society. Like it or not, we're a reflection of society. Marijuana use and cocaine use went through the roof. Followed quickly thereafter by that. We didn't have a way to test for them. We didn't have a way that not only could you test for them, but the lawyers would believe in it. So we could say proof positive. And then it was, we got a test, we got a way to prove it. Yeah, but what about your chain of custody? All the things you wrestle with today. We started from ground zero. We had never had to worry about that. But now we had to worry about it. And it wasn't a problem that we liked worrying about. It was a problem we needed to worry about. Another story, another story. General Wilson has retired successful tour. General Barrow was a new commandant. General Barrow was coming down to talk to AWS at the time, not EWS. General Barrow has just instituted mandatory urinalysis for the Marine Corps. The captains at AWS are furious. That's assault on my integrity. I would never use drugs. Yeah, but unfortunately, there's a handful of Marines who use drugs. And we're all going to take urinalysis. Word gets back to General Barrow. He says, sir, if you're going to get the snot beat out of me, you said that thought, you know. He says, well, you're there and they're going to come at you, all these captains in Q&A, and they're going to say, why does everybody have to take the urinalysis test? Why can't you do it selected? The ones who you know are in problem with random or something like that. Joe Barrow thank you, you got it. Joe Barrow shows up at AWS that morning late. He gets up, he walks on the stage, he says, excuse me, Joe, this is a... Uh, I am habitually punctual, and I'm sorry to be late this morning. I just want to let you know that before I came down here, I was complying with the Omar, and I just took my urinalysis this morning. <laughs> Not too many questions, have you heard? <laughs> <laughs> I am late, but it will be done. Uh, anyway, there's where the drug use was in the Marine Corps. The whole question now is, Marine Corps, proven, ready, discipline, attention, you know, uh, picking the right people, training the right people, lots of questions. Next slide. Okay, racial discourse. The positive steps that we had taken to the Executive Order 8802 with FDR and Truman and the stand up of the 51st Special Defense Battalion and folks like Hashmark Johnson, who came in as Sergeant Major, Edgar Huff, the identification of Frank Peterson, first black Brigadier General, leadership by great Marines in Vietnam, Arnie Fields. Gil Robinson, okay, folks afterwards, Cliff Stanley, all of that was at risk right now because Main Street America, blacks and whites were going after each other. And we have big problems in the Marine Corps. We had cross burnings, cross burnings on almost all major installations Camp Schwab, Camp Pendleton, Camp Lejeune. Cross burnings. We had a clean house. Part of the problem was we were overrepresented, if there is such a thing, in the enlisted ranks by a large percentage of blacks who were part of the Magnum Project 1,000, part of the non-high school graduates, and there was an unfair perception that that's the root of the problem. And we were underrepresented at the company grade officer level until we started going back into historically black colleges and universities. And you go to Cheney State and get with Dennis General Ron Coleman, and you go out and get Walt Gasket, but you look for quality. The problem was whether you're enlisted or an officer, if you're looking for GCT scores and not high school grads, or you're looking at small schools but not historically black colleges and universities, where all you and the Marines and the recruiting service you know, we were fishing in the wrong pond. We were fishing in the wrong pond. And if you want quality, you look for quality. And quality begets quality. And when you get quality in, you treat them like quality. And you build cohesion and you build core. And those are lessons that we had to learn throughout the Marine Corps. 
going to give you another story that is only a handful that stick home with me. I'm standing on my second tour of duty. I told you I checked the one three. I have now survived. The fact that I only got 18 out there and three are flip flops and four have no shaving chins. And, and we have deployed for 90 days over to Buffalo or to the Big Island and we're back. And it is now Thanksgiving weekend. And my sponsor is married. We didn't have to be married officers even back then. And he's got to be on Thanksgiving Day. And I said, hey, come on, piece of cake. I'll take your duty for you. I'm a bachelor. You know, I got it. Okay? He said, no, you don't have it. I said, yeah, I got it. I said, well, have you still duty for you? I still duty once. I got this down. I'm good. I stand OD. I'm get, you know, it's Thanksgiving weekend. Put my green sateens on, which just starts so tight, you know. I'm walking like this to the chow hall. I get out of the chow hall. Uh, I'm in 1 3, Bravo 1 3. You go in the chow hall, people sit. That's the uh, infantry training unit over there. That's Fox 2 3. That's Charlie 1 3. You only sit by your company. And only if you only sit by your company, well, that's Fox 2 3 White Marines. That's Charlie 1 3 Black Marines. That's the all Samoan platoon. We had it. Okay. <laughs> That's the all Hawaiian platoon. Those are the Spanish speakers. I mean, where's the sense of brotherhood? But at Thanksgiving meal, one of the Marines, I won't tell you what unit, I won't tell you what color, he gets up and another Marine says, hey mate, bust your tray. The Marine leans over, picks up his tray, which is a metal tray at that time, screams out the four letter epithet and just swings the tray and slices the Marine's face over. As the staff duty goes to step in, he says, Dad, we need to get involved. <coughs> Does the same thing to him. Within about a half an hour, the chow hall is empty. The Marines are going back to their stations. For whatever reason, folks in 2 3 come across the 112, the RDF, tear down the Tory gate. The next thing you know, we have a full scale race riot, windows broken, signs torn down, the ODs are back calling their battalion leadership, and within five hours, we have mustered every officer and staff NCO on the island of Hawaii. All the ODs are locked and loaded. Locked and loaded. And we're trying to break up fights and race riots all around Kaneo. Now, like I said, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You've never seen this today, but it happened. As part of, and we had to dig ourselves out of that. Another story. Okay, thanks. All right, while all this is going on, we talked about how well we did in Beirut with General Monday and everybody in the 50s. We still get measured by our enemies. So in between Eagle Pole and Frequent Wind, in that two-week gap, a container ship leaves Hong Kong. It's bound from Cambodia. It's the Maya West. It gets hijacked off the coast of Vietnam, or off the coast of uh, uh, Cambodia in the South China Sea. President Ford says, hey, we're ready service. That shouldn't happen. We can fix this. Some questionable indications and warnings about who's on the ship is what we're doing. Now, this is part of our national mystique here. That we're not doing too well in Vietnam. We need a win here. We're going to do this. Message goes out to PACOM. This is goes from PACOM to a, a three map and now the third more dip. We're going to take it over the Miami West. There's an 1,100 man or 1,100 Marine Rapid reaction force that's supposed to go do this. They get them. Basically, at the time, they can get 2 9. Randy Austin and 2 9. And they get four companies and they put them on a bird and they fly them to Utapal, Thailand. And then in Utapal, Thailand, they marry them up with 11 Air Force HH 53s. And they send one company in after the ship and two companies in after the crew. One is on Koh Tang Island and one is on Koh Rang Island. Oh, there's no recipe for disaster there. Okay. Basically, they take the Delta company that's going on board ship, they land on the, on the Holt, which is another ship, they cross that, they go on the Maya West. Gas masks and everything. They do very well, put themselves well. No hostages, nothing on the ship, empty ship. Hostages have been moved to Kotang Island. Two other companies going to Kotang Island. Six of the 11 helos are either shot or crashed on the way in. Four, 41, 43 killed, 21 injured, before you even get sporadic fighting, okay? So that, this is now an indication of maybe we really aren't as ready as we thought. 
And maybe that strategic failure, maybe there's some underpinnings here. This is in 1975. You flash forward four years when you got the Iranian hostage rescues, and the, the Iranian hostage situation, 440 days America held hostage, and then you try to do Eagle Claw on Desert One, and you see the problems with inter service cooperation, adequate training, uh, training under harsh conditions. This was probably the leading indicator that we weren't as ready as we should be. Next, thanks. Okay, General Wilson and General Barrett. They personally reaffirmed that this is all about people. I started to tell you a story the other day, and I, I have not told it here earlier. General Barrow, we used to delight in telling the story about how he got into, did I tell you this one about China? I did, did I see him? I haven't seen you in a moment, forget about it. Okay, got it. Uh, anyway, it's all about people. Both of those comments believed it was all about people. Recruiting the right people, training the right people, bringing the right recruiters in, bringing the right drill instructors in, bringing the right leaders in. It was about people. And that's what the message is today. Focus on people, we'll figure out the money piece, we'll figure out the training piece. You've got to get the people piece right. And they used the strength of their office and the strength of their commissions on the Hill and on the services to literally turn the Marine Corps around. When you ask the generational officers that came in between 1973 and 1983, in that 10 year period, coming out of Vietnam and the eight years that those two men were coming out, these two men saved the Marine Corps. They didn't just leave the Marine Corps, they didn't just turn the Marine Corps around, they saved the Marine Corps. And this is with due respect to everybody else who's in the trenches growing up. Lieutenant colonels, uh, first sergeants, everybody. But we needed somebody at the top to say, this is what right looks like, and this is what the direction looks like. And that's what these two leaders did. Okay, no toleration for those who wouldn't get on board. Thanks. Okay, quantity over quality. Uh, we're willing to accept end strength decreases until they got the right people. We're willing to accept private units until they got the right people. We're willing to accept budget cuts to until they got the right people. They put their money where their mouth is, they put their energy where their mouth is, they walk the talk. Okay. You can see where we went by, by FY77, and then there's another slide about where we were for FY82. General Wilson said 70%, or 75%. And that wasn't the goal, that was the standard. That was the standard. You know, let, let, me, let me clear up a misunderstanding on your part. Okay, I got it, that was the standard. Uh, by the time General Barrow left office, we had left from 46% to over 90%. Over 90%. And we were still doing Western and Eliza Block drug testing. We were still doing PFTs. We had raised the bar. We had held ourselves accountable and we had gone fishing in the right ponds. Next slide. Okay. Now, here's some other stuff going on in the Marine Corps. General Barrow's story. General Barrow's manpower. He's seen recruiting as a drill instructor. He's been the CG of Paris Island. And there's a lot of problems with the way the recruiting service is talking to each other. Now, the folks who have a recruiting duty now, they don't understand this history. Your dad might, okay? Joe Bauer decides, hey, we've got a problem here in that the recruiters and the drill instructors, they don't feel like they're on the same team. So he figures out a plan with his leadership about where he wants to go, and he's going to bring the two services together, make them sing from the same sheet of church for you. So he goes down to Paris Island, and he's getting ready to explain what's going on. But he figures he'll get that in day and son first. He says, well, well, we haven't any challenges in recruit training here. Or any challenges we could. And sure enough, you know, Bill instructor stands up and says, Hey, sir, we're working on our backside off here. We're working 80 to 100 hours a week. You know, you send down 120, we're trying to get things down to 90. We've only got 12 weeks to do this. We're working really hard down here. You know, we're working hard. We're making all the entry missions. But life would be a lot easier if the recruiters wouldn't shovel their trash down here. They just pick up their quality mission. And of course, recruiters take a little longer, so they stand up there and say, you know, General Bow, you give us a window here. And we know high school graduates are going up, and we know drug tolerance is going down. You give us a window. We always make that bar. You give us a number of quantity of quality, we make that bar. You give us parameters in the window, we make that window. We, we put them all in the window. And damn those recruit those drill instructors. I mean, they're living fat and packy down in Paris Island and San Diego. They have all the infrastructure they need. They can PT whenever they want. They got four drill instructors. I'm out here in a two-man fight in a home in West Wyoming and Framingham, Mass. And you know, I need the money for a car, and I'm working my tail end off. And if they were working a little harder, we wouldn't have this problem. And of course, the next thing you know, you're having a, an Irish brawl down there, okay? I said, John Barrow stands up. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I said, well, I can see we have a little difference of opinion. He said, let me tell you what we're going to do. See again? Let me clear up the misunderstanding on your part. Let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put the two of you together. There will be one general. And the general will be in charge of recruiting and 
the recruiter. And the, general, and the recruiters will not get credit. You don't get credit when you ship him and stands on the yellow footprints. You won't get credit until he graduates. You now have a vested interest in that you'll send the right quality, and he's physically fit, and he's smart, and he won't graduate. Hello, tell him something. You think you're going to get a work coach promotion? And you know, oh, you have to, they have to win a drill competition, because they have to win on the rifle range. So you need to build a police unit. And you can't do that unless those recruiters are sending you the right quality. So perhaps you want to leave Paris and San Diego every now and then, well, and see what they're doing. You, perhaps we ought to talk to each other. And there's one general who make that happen. Silence in the room. The guy stands up again, but it's just, yeah, maybe you've settled that matter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide. There it is. Just so you, you know that, you know, Lynn Anderson, part of the country western song, she, she came out when we did this. That's uh, Staff Sergeant Talafero. Uh, Paris Island runs a, was a docent at the museum down there for many years. It's all about five foot six, harder than woodpecker lips, but that's Staff Sergeant T. Yeah. Okay? Now, I have one of the originals of this photo. And if you don't think that is a stark reminder, General Wilson, just like General Bowen, never needed to say a thing. <laughs> he ran rod straight, lean in his 60s, hand behind his back, and he's just saying, what in God's name is that? <laughs> 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 Next slide. Okay, so we have a lot of work to do. We have recruiting work to do, recruit training work to do, weight control work to do, drug issues to do, but the most important thing is we had to build trust. We had to build trust amongst us in the Marine Corps, we had to build trust with the American people, we had to rebuild trust on Capitol Hill. And the two individuals, the four, the Sergeant Major Fasaro and Sergeant Major Crawford, they rebuilt that. Personal involvement, and they went back to General Lejeune. Student, teacher, leader, mentor. Next slide. Okay, here's a couple of the specific things that happened, and you can see some of these initiatives right now, because we drifted away from this. So you want to know, after McClure tragically died, they took a whole generation of lieutenants who were on their tours in Okinawa. Second lieutenants when they showed up, first lieutenants when they left, thought they were going to go back to Quantico and teach at TBS and stuff. And they all went, they all went to Paris Island and San Diego. Some of them, okay, it's California, okay, it's recruit training. Some of them, Walmart's all the way across the West Pacific, okay? But let me tell you the names of some of those lieutenants who went. John Goulin, Joe McMahon, Bob Mello. Lessons learned. Not relearned, lessons learned. Okay? We need adequate supervision at the depots. We need the right people there. We need platoons on the right size. We need fourth drill instructors and fourth hats. We need second series officers. Let's do it right. Okay? Expeditious discharge program. This is what I talked about a little while ago. General Wilson decided, okay, look, I'm going to get help you with your ranch strength here. So he started putting out guidance, you know, if they have a special court martial, if they have two leaders, and you couldn't just summarily throw them out, because intelligent men that they were good leaders, they were saying, hey, look, some of these jokes, maybe they've seen the light. Maybe it took them two blacks across the head, but maybe they've seen the light. But this is where we started the 6105 council entry, for all you who hate it, okay? Nobody knew what a 6105 entry was before, but we started the 6105, so you could bring those Marines in and say, you know, Lance Corporal Lee Meyer, you can promote him now. You're doing pretty well. But I noticed, Lance Corporal Lee, I noticed that you were a PFC three times. And I noticed, even though you beat the rap on that special, I know you got two summaries and two NJPs. I'm just, I want you to sign here. I want you to understand. You need to mend your ways forever and ever. Never go back to that Marine Corps before. You understand that? Because the minute you look at Staff Sergeant Crosswise or get charged for something, I'm throwing you out. That's what we did. That's how we went down. Next slide. Uh, unit, now I'm going to talk real quick about a couple other things going on in the report. Vietnam, eight-year war, one-year war fought eight times. Eleven-year war, one-year war fought eleven times. Part of it was we'd send people as individual replacements to Okinawa. We'd send people as individual replacements to uh, Vietnam. The issue then was how do you build unit cohesion? If we're going to draft the right people, excuse me, recruit the right people, we're going to boot camp train the right people, and we're going to send them out to the fleet, how can we get the boys as a unit? General Wilson. We're going to change this. We're going to start doing unit deployment programs. 
This is when we started filling up all the battalions at the Fourth Rifle Company and sending battalions and squadrons as you to deploy and send individual deployment. So you build as a unit, train as a unit, deploy as a unit. Now all you Afghanistan or Iraq vets, can you imagine playing that war? Knowing that you're going to get 12% of your, uh, you know, 8% of your company once a month for 12 months? Look at the legions that, would you? The words in the, as John Humphrey says, the words in the music in the movie don't match. Okay? Uh, so we had to change that. A couple other things there too. The well, open slide base, okay? Come on, that we started getting on board, much against our, our counterculture here, taking on about the Navy and the Air Force we're doing. And, okay, you can still strike the room, you can still fall out on the parade deck. Uh, you know, we, we need to get away from solid forward concrete, like the time we lived in that were made in 1948 to 1952 before Korea. And we're still living in, in the 70s and 80s, okay? Get rid of the open squad base, start building barracks. Next slide. Your analysis, we already covered that one. You can see what the numbers were there about how we got from uh, the high where we were and where we were at uh, in, in terms of 2011, okay? We used to track discharges by your analysis. We used to track by desertion. It's not even there today. Desertion is less than like a half of a percent. Uh, drug test less than 2%. And, 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 again, the Marine Corps today and the Marine Corps uh, 40 years ago completely different. Next slide. Our modernization. In the midst of all this, we still got to get ready to fight the next war. We're using the equipment that has been there since the 1940s and 50s. You will hear in the next presentation of the Lord Lecture Series, General Gulak talk about his story about being in a winter exercise in Korea, freezing to death in a field jacket, and then saying, to himself, geez, I wonder if I open this up if I'll see Victor H. Who I like in here. It's the one my dad had in Korea in 1951. Okay? Because the gear just kept getting hand down. We never modernized. We weren't taking advantage of the technology out there. We had to change our ships, change our aircraft, change our weapons, change our small unit gear. Everything needed to change. But we didn't have an argument to do that until A, the country had money after Vietnam, and B, we could make the case that we had the right people that if you gave us the money and the gear, we were going to take care of it. We go was proud for years and years ago. We can do it on two, two cents or five cents on the dollar. We're a frugal force, but we had challenges. We had challenges. Okay. Uh, Soviets, PGMs, you can see where the Soviet Union's going. They surprised the hell out of us with Sputnik. So we're behind technologically. We're, we're fighting to get caught up in the space race. We're fighting to get caught up in terms of uh, GDP that we put into defense dollars. Okay, next. Okay, there's some criticisms of the Marine Corps about where we're at. Part of the fight that we'll have, and I know General Fulford knows this from later on, being a DCOM at, uh, at UCOM uh, when they had all that stuff. We were fighting for mission relevance in the Marine Corps, too. I mean, since 1953, again, uh, Mansfield, Douglas Mansfield, got most ready when the nation's least ready, but where are we going to go? We're not going into the fall of the gap. We're not going to go with the Army in Germany. And we carved out a mission. Can we go on the flanks? Can we do something in Norway? Can we do something uh, to either the Med or up through Gallipoli in the Adriatic? But we had to carve out a mission statement. We had to get smart folks to look at geographic repositioning, training, equipping for those missions. We started doing bulb guard in Northern Norway. We started going up to Norway. We started doing exercises in, in, uh, in the Med on the flanks in Naples. We started deliberately sending more units over there, whether they were flying over from the States or whether they were on ships. I talked earlier about General Gray and General Nichols. They were both down in the 2nd Marines, okay? One of the exercises, when General Gray was selected for a general officer, two things happened. First, he was selected for colonel. He thought he was going to get a command. General Olson said, no, not quite so fast. We're going to send you to Okinawa. He says, okay. And done, by that time, I think he'd done five or six tours in Vietnam. So he says, I can go to Okinawa. He says, no, you don't understand. You're going to be the camp commandant. You're going to be nominally 4th Marines, but you're going to be the camp commandant. He <laughs> General Gray will tell you to this, I just talked to him last week. One of the most educational and rewarding tours of his career. Because when he got over there, he saw firsthand that the Marine Corps he loved and the operational readiness and the tactical readiness that was winning in Vietnam was not resident in the organized training and equipped forces at Camp Hansen and was not ready in this, ready and indicated by the quality of people here. So he started doing things like high school graduation program. Staff NCOs and officers teaching at night. He started doing extracurricular activities and sports programs. And he started doing things in the 70s at Hanson 
that would let Marines know that you cared about them today. You didn't want them to go out to Kinville and get drunk. You cared about what they were doing today to stay mentally engaged and stay physically fit. And you cared about them getting high school degrees sitting around the Marine Board. But those are the kinds of things we had to do with our force structure. We also had to get aircraft back. There's another slide here, too. General Wilson made some really uh, brave and bold decisions about where aviation modernization was going in the Marine Corps coming out of Vietnam, both rotary wing and fixed wing. We had to look at ships. You ever talk pre position ships? Where, where's all the Marine Corps students? Okay, uh, I, I, I'm looking at you, Colonel Joe. Okay. You all had to do a paper to graduate? Yes, sir. Yeah, good. All right. So, National War College in the late 1960s. There's a, grad, there's a student in there. He's a Marine Lieutenant Colonel Colonel. His last name is Barrow. He has to do a paper. He does a paper about, hey, we got a lot of Marines over here. We got a passable number of aircraft. You know, I'm looking at a cube and square and distance of We can't get everything over to the fight and the aircraft. We're not going to have enough aircraft. We're not going to have enough time and enough money. How about if we preposition gear over there? That was his paper as a colonel at the War College. Near term preposition ships, first instantiation of this, first attempt, second one, next slide. MPS. MPS, okay? General Power's other quote, okay? When, when the chips are down and you talk about war fighting, real leaders talk about logistics. I don't mean to throw that bone to all the O4s in the house, not the O3s, okay? But real leaders talk about logistics. General Bauer knew that we had to have gear, ability to maintain and, and fix, ability to launch and recover, ability to bring these spare parts, ability to catalog the RSOI functions we can do from feet wet as well as feet dry. NTPS and MPS, late 70s, early 80s. Okay, next slide. Aviation. When I see this slide, I think it's certainly General Wilson who said, hey, I'm going to cash in some F-14s and we're going to put all our chips in Stovall. Okay, again, with the help of Senator Glenn, against uh, the tide of uh, many others on the Hill, and certainly against the United States Navy, brothers in arms and battle buddies and shipmates that they are, okay? Uh, General Wilson and General Barrow, they went over to the Hill and, and carried these conversations privately on the Hill, and they came back and told the CNO in a second now what they were going to do. Hey, I, I don't worry about your program here. You can go back. That's just pencil anyway. You're going to redo it because I just cashed in 34 F-14s from under my stoves. Okay? That was the argument. Leaders in the Marine Corps, just to show you that they're everywhere, I think Lieutenant General Tom Miller. I think of Lieutenant General Andy O'Donnell. I think of Lieutenant General Phil Shuttler. And the aviation leaders who championed rotary wing, fixed wing, maintenance, and training stood up things like Mars out there in the high desert to get us ready to do aviation missions, rotary wing and fixed wing, so we could build an ACTEC. General Wilson will slide to a slide again about 29 bombs, okay? And how EAF and Camp Wilson out there. But how we started not only building the legs of the stool, but consciously thinking about how the legs came together, air, ground, logistics. Next slide. Okay, here's a couple of aviation trends in the Marine Corps. You can see down the bottom there, General Wilson cashing in there. <laughs> and trying to get them in a tight model series and get a little bit more streamlined. So we're having the same argument back in the mid-70s that we're having today. Next slide. There's rotary wing changes, obviously get the AH-1T Cobra in there, okay? And you can see all the different frames that are coming in, including the 53 Alpha Delta Echo. I mean, so we're modernizing. We're slowly trying to get all these ships moving in the right direction. Ground readiness, aviation readiness, equipment readiness, quality people, quality leaders. Next slide. Okay, here's some shots on ground modernization. This is when we introduced the concept of uh, long maw haw in terms of light, medium, and heavy anti tank assault weapons. And we're worried about where the Soviets are going to be with BTRs and, uh, and their tanks. And you can see how we modernized from the M42, 48, 60 into the M1 series. We moved our self propeller artillery. Uh, finally, phase it out of the Marine Corps because we're looking at lighter and faster. We're looking at uh, artillery that can be lifted by the 53. Next slide. All right, and training. Again, as I said, we're moving out to 29 bombs. We're practicing combined arms operations originally Palm, palm X, and then the uh, CACs after that. Okay, integration. Okay. All right, so here's a conclusion before we open up for a couple questions here. I, I told you about crisis. The crisis doesn't have to be external. Certainly, there are external crises. Could be Vietnam, could be Southwest Asia. A lot of times, crisis is an internal crisis, and it doesn't have to be a budgetary crisis or a joint chiefs crisis. Sometimes it's a manpower crisis. But the whole point is, when you see a crisis, you got to step up to the plate and resolve it, and it takes leadership. Fortunately, unsurprisingly to all of you, 
We had quality leaders in the Marine Corps coming out of Vietnam, many of them steeled and fired in World War II in Korea, that enabled us to get through this 8, 10, 13 year period where we were really kind of in the doldrums. And again, tactically, Marines love being Marines. Marines love getting in a fight. So again, we're only talking about a small percentage of Marine Corps, but it was a very visible percentage, a very vocal percentage, and it was a hell of a lot larger percentage than we had ever seen before or we ever wanted. And the lesson we learned was you need leaders at the top, like Robert H. Farrell and Louis H. Wilson, to lead us to do this. So great to be with you. you got Thank you, sir. Uh, Questions? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. A couple of questions. Uh, just raise your hand. I'll call you out and we'll get you to ask a question. I'm looking around, trying to see the audience, and I'm seeing no raised hands. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, General, uh, if we don't have any questions, come on up. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, sir. If we can please have Mr. and Mrs. Jared and Janet Wilson Taylor uh, come up here, please, and if Colonel Rob Barrow could please come up here. Uh, Marine Corps University, we're honored to have the families of General Wilson and General Barrow with us today. Just want to. Uh, General Paxton, sir, if you could please come. Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, Colonel Barrow, on behalf of Brinkley University, thank you very much for coming to be with us for this special occasion. We have a small token of our appreciation. We have the poster of the event with a personal letter from General Paxton and a letter from myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'd also like to offer you and Colonel Barrett the opportunity to make a few comments to our students, please. I do have a, just a, you mind if I come over here? No, ma'am. Things I won't be long, <laughs> but I have to be able to see. So, Joe Paxton and Joe Bowers, Dr. Niemeyer, Rob, Marine Corps family and friends. It's great to be back in Quantico, one of my favorite hometowns, the heart of the Marine Corps, the crossroads of the Marine Corps, and dare I say, the heart of the Marine Corps. Back on this campus, the Marine Corps University, the place that elegantly embodies the soul of the Eagle Globe and Anchor. Thank you for the invitation to come to the Graves B. Erskine lecture and to have the joy of learning something new about my father. I can't add anything much to the historical record of my father's actions in the Marine Corps, either on the battlefield or in command as he did not bring his work home. His desk at home was bare, and he would come home and put his feet up, lean back in his chair, and think. <laughs> My mother said, please stop thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that he was an imposing and a handsome man, six foot four, with a professional demeanor, steely blue eyes, and a great sense of humor. Some of the repeatable descriptions of him <laughs> commonly heard were lean and mean and smiling cobra. <laughs> he was a planner throughout his life, always looking to the future, always thinking and recalculating, but never afraid to make a decision and not afraid of a long plan. 
His accomplishments, both in the Marine Corps and in his personal life as a whole, are a testament to this fact. He, like General Barrow, grew up in the South and both brought with them to the Marine Corps every good thing that the, word, that the term Southern gentleman entails. The Marine Corps was the ideal vehicle for them to flourish and to soar. The Marine Corps was never a job, it was a joy. As my father often said, every day in the Marine Corps is like Sunday on farm. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to take a minute to relay a story that speaks to his personality and his awesomeness as a father that you might find revealing, perhaps endearing, hopefully entertaining. The Wilson family was, a, was small, just the three of us. The Marine Corps was our extended family, and within that family, we all had our jobs. Here I would be remiss if I did not mention my mother, who was the most important part of the team. But as his only child, my job was to pay attention, to follow orders, and I did that willingly. Dad was quite comfortable using me as a training tool. <laughs> when I was four years old, and Dad was the commanding officer of TNT here at Quantico, to my mother's chagrin and my grandmother's horror, in our backyard at quarters 414, he taught me to climb a rope, hand over hand, not using my feet. Without telling my mother, he would take me on a field trip to the obstacle course at the base school, where he would have me demonstrate to Marines having difficulty with the rope climb to tell <laughs> philosophy the Marine Corps instilled. I am grateful to him for so many things, and I am grateful to the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps family as well for honing him to be a great leader, a great commandant, and the best father ever. Thank you. Paxton, Charlie, you covered it quite well. Not a lot to add, but maybe a few personal vignettes and uh, some thoughts to consider and things to take with you when you leave. My dad uh, took over Parasol in 1972, same year that I started the ninth grade. And I watched him for uh, that three year tour, the things that concerned him the most where, as General Paxson has touched on, the quality of recruits, and you saw the numbers of mental group fours, which those who've been recruiters here, they can spell their name correctly three times in a row. <laughs> mental group fours, and physically and morally unfit, and the Marine Corps had a policy where they thought they could, they could make anybody a Marine. And he pushed back, and also the recruit abuse that was taking place there at, shortly after General Wilson took over, uh, McClure and Hiscock events happened, and the Marine Corps was on the ropes on Capitol Hill testifying before a congressional committee. One of the members of, of that committee was actually a guy named Charlie Wilson from Texas, Charlie Wilson's War, movie, book, but uh, only because of the reputation of General Wilson and his integrity and character and that of my father did the Marine Corps get through that. And literally, after a bad morning of testimony, General Wilson and my dad went to lunch together. And uh, it, was, it was an ugly morning. And Lou goes, Bob, we got to do something. And my dad says, Lou, we got to figure this out. This is not going well. None in this room, except those older than myself, real, don't realize how close we came to losing recruit training at both depots, we would have had a Joint Forces Indoctrination Center. And at the end of that, one, two, three, four, 
you're five Marines, you're going in the Air Force, and all of us here in this room that are Marines, we know that would have been the death of the Marine Corps. At that lunch, without any manpower studies, my dad was manpower at the time, or going back and talking to the iron majors and colonels, they made a command decision right there, going to put 20 more officers at each depot. And a good friend of mine, retired General Rick Zilmer, a mentor of mine, company commander, they call themselves the Fab 40. And that's, those are the officers that went by direction of General Wilson and my dad. And that was enough to give, you know, get the dogs off at, at the depots. Over the course of uh, the last 10 or 15 years, we have gotten away from that officer supervision. And for a period of time, we were back at the same supervision levels we had after Ribbon Creek. And General Neller and, and others, to their credit, have reinstituted the, the supervision levels we had previously at Paris Island and, and uh, San Diego. And the problems are going to be fixed. But I will say that the, the Marine Corps, what all of us should be concerned, and those who love it, and you'll love it long till the day you die, we need to be concerned about those attacks from within and the, the attacks from without. And the attacks from within are ourselves, not taking care of each other. When you see another drill instructor doing something wrong or a re recruiter cutting a, a corner or somebody taking a shortcut, it's not damaging them, it's damaging the core that we love. And we need to make sure that we treat it as a precious gift that we've been given to be part of it and to, and to serve. And that's protected against each other. And you know, predominantly the manpower thing, uh, presentation today is it's recruit uh, drill instructors. Proper conduct and behavior. The idea, and we've seen it here recently with senior officers at the depots being relieved for disciplinary or character flaws or uh, lack of leadership. The idea that uh, something at Paris Island could exist called the dungeon and other drill instructors not know about it or series officers or company commanders or first sergeants or series chiefs and not say something about it is preposterous. That closely knit supervisory environment down there, there's no way. But nobody stepped up, and as a result, we have Marines who have been, you know, recruits who have been injured and harmed, and we got officers whose careers have been ended, from commanding generals there to battalion commanders and regimental commanders. Take care of each other. Then there are the fights that uh, come from without, outside the core. And I'll share one little story that I shared with the general earlier, and that is the courage to stand up and protect this organization we call the Marine Corps and that we love. And in 19, I want to say uh, 1981, the Brigadier General promotion list came before my dad's desk, and he signed it, and it goes off to the Secretary of the Navy. Three or four days later, that list came back with a note, handwritten note, is this the list, are you sure, et cetera. My dad called in the, the uh, recorder of the board and said, is this the list, are these the names? Yes, sir. Sends it back over to the second half. Second half pushed back a second time on the list. And then my dad says, bring the president of the board down, the lieutenant general came down. So, What's going on here? And he said, sir, Colonel so-and-so, the Secretary of the Navy's uh, senior military aide, Secretary of the Navy wants uh, him to be a Brigadier General, thinks he should be on the list. I got it. He drafts two letters. One is the promotion board, attachment A, and one is his letter of resignation, attachment B and send it over to the Secretary of the Navy with a note, please see Ref A and for signature. If unable to sign Ref A, please sign Ref B <laughs> or attachment B. 
That's the kind of courage we need to have in our own institution, with each, each other, protecting our core against our, our peers, contemporaries, and seniors, and standing up to them as well. Uh, and that's what will protect this institution. So, Marines, I, I thank you for being here. I'm just some old bald guy from Tampa, Florida. That All right. Uh, <laughs> came up here at the, at the General's invitation. I thank you for your very kind gift. Charlie and General, those are Phenomenal presentation, sir. You covered it all, and I, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you all. Right. There is a future commandant of the Marine Corps out there among you. There is a future combatant commander out there among you. There is a future service chief, especially among our allies and partners out there among you. There are future deputy commandants out there among you. There are future sergeants major and master gunnery sergeants of Marines out there among you all. It is our sincere hope, although we don't know who you or who he or she may be, but it is our sincere hope that you will never ever forget what you heard here this afternoon from our distinguished guests and another everlasting giant of our Corps, General Paxton. Sir, uh, thank you for honoring us. Thank you for your comments. We have a small token of our appreciation on behalf of Green Corps University, the families of General Wilson, families of General Barrow. We have this. Yeah, thanks, sir. Honored to be here and honored to talk about two great Marine leaders. Thank you.